Good morning on the West Coast, good afternoon on the East Coast, and good evening to my friends in the UK and Europe, if, if you're tuned in. Uh, you have the Carolina Music Museum and Tom Strange, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, our first, our, our, our current exhibit, uh, Seven Centuries of uh, Stringed Keyboard Instruments. And uh, we're going to take you through a little tour of the museum here. Just to give you a flavor, this is going to be roughly 30 to 40 minutes, so we're going to kind of hurry through some elements, but I'm going to keep coming back uh, every uh, Wednesday and Friday uh, with either myself or uh, my other curator, uh, Alexandra Cade, going to be talking to you about uh, the various uh, musical instruments that we have at the museum. Uh, as most of you know, uh, this time last year we began negotiations with the Sigel estate over the great collection of uh, Marlo Sigel and uh, that, has, that collection has actually come to Greenville and we're going to be reviewing some of those as a sneak preview before the big sensational Sigel uh, exhibit opens up. Uh, probably in the summer uh, of this year. We are also going to be changing our name from Carolina Music Museum to Sigel Music Museum. And this is something that I'm actually looking very much forward to because I think uh, with the collections that I had, the collection that Marlowe had, which was just you know, world renowned, and some other smaller collections that have come in, uh, you know, we are well set to talk to you about these musical instruments. Uh, now, a little bit of a preface, just to say, for those that don't know us, uh, this museum is sort of an experiential museum, meaning that more often than not, the instruments actually do play. And I'm going to demonstrate a few of those today. I'm not the artist. I don't ever claim to be. You won't see me on that stage performing for the audience, but I can demonstrate a few sounds. And then from time to time, uh, on one of these uh, Wednesday or Friday events, we're going to have some real artists to come in. We have some wonderful musicians uh, actually on our board uh, who I can get to come and, and help us with some things. So you're going to get to hear some of these great instruments. Uh, just to answer the question, do you restore all the instruments? And the answer is no, we do not restore all the instruments. Uh, restoration is something, if you'll go to the newsletter uh, for this month, You'll see the repair slash restoration that I'm doing on the 1761 uh, Jacob Kirkman uh, harpsichord, the one that was owned by Queen Charlotte. And uh, I think that kind of goes through the various levels of care and concern that we take as we're beginning to look at should we restore something, should we repair something, should something be simply left to look at and for the future to, uh, to, to dig into. So with that preface in mind, uh, what do we mean by seven centuries of keyboards? Well, we're starting uh, roughly the year, you know, 1350 to 1380. And I have in front of me uh, this little instrument here. And you're going to say, well, Tom, that looks a great deal like a, a, a chessboard. Thank you for showing me that. In fact, uh, as you can see, uh, there is a keyboard sticking out of this. And this instrument was known as the checker. So the checker, uh, at one point in the 20th century, we thought, well, maybe that was just a myth. Maybe there wasn't anything really going on there. But in fact, here's one of the manifestations of this. Uh, we can tell from the people who wrote about having experienced these that there was actually a musical instrument inside and then in the year 1995, when they were redoing, restoring the, the chapel of St. Mary at uh, the Cathedral of Le Mans, uh, the, the whole ceiling is covered in these wonderful musical angels. And they're all playing or singing or there's music associated, except for this one character here. And this little guy, as you can see, uh, it looks like he's in front of a chessboard. In fact, if you look very, very closely, you can actually see chess pieces on the board. Uh, and then if you also notice, this hand uh, appears to be actually uh, playing the, the, a keyboard that's extending. This was a checker, uh, painted around the year 1380, and it's the only surviving extant uh, image that we have of the thing other than like a schematic or a diagram. I'm actually going to go into the, the story of the checker a little deeper in one of our uh, subsequent uh, 
you know, 30 minute episodes that we're going to do because I think it's very fascinating. Right now, I'm going to hurry us through just a little bit and uh, mention that what I have accompanying this checker uh, from approximately the year 1420 or 1425, I believe, uh, is this uh, image here. Uh, and this is from the uh, altarpiece at the Cathedral of Minden. Uh, it's a, a giant rose uh, in the center, roughly six feet in diameter. And wonderfully carved into this were all these musical figures. And one guy is playing the rumble part, pot, rumble pot, the rumble pot, the clavichord, a very, very small harpsichord, and then below here, a hogshead psaltery. So one of the things that I did was to actually recreate these instruments. Um, here is the rumble pot. One would wet one's fingers and then rub up and down the, the stick, making a rubbing sound that goes rub, 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 rub. It's kind of like a percussion. Uh, we have here a clavichord. You know, with this one, I have actually built the clavichord that uh, Arnaud had the famous drawing for. So just a little bit later than, than maybe the, the 1420 uh, harpsichord that you see, but uh, always quiet but very interesting. Very quiet little instrument, but very nice little personal instrument, and it's actually a full musical instrument all the way from the, the, the bass to the treble. So, uh, something that you can got, kind of can kind of go and explore a little bit later. Uh, along with the clavichord, we had this very first representation of the harpsichord. And uh, you know, my apologies. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that you guys are seeing things actually, uh, you know, turned around. Uh, but uh, imagine that this is the the harpsichord, you know, if effectively reflected from the carving that we have, so that uh, in the original carving, uh, we had the, the treble in the left hand and the bass in the right hand. I reversed it so that it doesn't give me a complete and total headache as I you know, try to demonstrate it. Uh, this lovely little instrument, uh, I think, was actually a, a real instrument, not simply an artist recreation. And all the other instruments are the right size why would he change the size of the harpsichord? I believe it looked, uh, you know, pretty much like this, with, with right at or just under two octaves of compass. And what might such a thing have sounded like, particularly since we see the angels playing? I apologize to everyone uh, in simply saying that, of course, I've made that little tune up, but there are some <laughs> lovely little tunes uh, that work very well on these instruments. And you can tell that the balance is kind of right. And imagine this in a large cathedral. Imagine this with all that echoes and, and the, the fact that you could hear these things you know, very, very clearly. A small, high-pitched, light instrument like this might still be very acceptable in such a, a setting. So, I think it's real. I think that uh, they were trying to show us a little bit about music at the time. And now we're going to rotate around and look at the uh, latter part of the 15th century and into the 16th century. So now I'm in front of uh, an Arno clavicemblem. For those of you who have uh, you know, studied this, you know that uh, Arno left us this wonderful drawing, right? And in this drawing, he's pretty much laid out everything that you need to know to go build one of these, so of course I had to build one. He describes uh, four different actions. So three of those actions are clavichord action, or harpsichord action, excuse me. They pluck the string 
in, uh, in various ways. And then for the fourth action, he gives us something that looks like this. And this is essentially a little hammer that flies up when the key has uh, traveled its full limit. It flies up and touches the string, hits the string, and falls away, and produces the very first piano sort of sound, because you could play this loud and soft. And uh, so what I have done is, is, is taken that uh, drawing that he had and uh, realized it in an instrument that does something like this. I think it's a very interesting sort of sound. And the idea that such an instrument was being uh, you know, designed and thought about so many hundreds of years before Bartolomeo Cristofori brings forward his piano concept is extremely interesting. Uh, Stuart Pollins has written on this extensively. Uh, would, uh, would love to hear from everybody on what they think of such an instrument. And then, you know, maybe some, uh, some, some questions might pop up as to, well, you know, what happened? I've always speculated that the hammer dulcimer being so much cheaper to make and being something that people had uh, some experience in building was probably the one that was uh, uh, continuing to be built and that the idea of attaching a keyboard to it was maybe a little bit expensive. Remember, all of these other instruments that I've shown you are reproductions built by myself uh, to kind of uh, you know, realize some of these early instruments that we don't have examples for. We do have an example here though uh, from circa 1570. This is an, a little Italian uh, uh, polygonal virginal. This is called a three-foot virginal. It's just a little larger than, than Altavina, the octave harpsichord. And most of these were designed to play at, uh, at pitches that would be a little off of the regular pitch. So you might be a third down or a fourth down or something like that. We've got this one uh, still at 415, uh, and that's you know, pretty much where it's been from, from most of the time that I've had it. Um, this one came to the, to the States in 1980, a collector friend of mine, and, and I bought it from him. Uh, but a, a lovely little instrument. Now what's really neat is that we now have, through the collection of Marlow Sigel, the uh, five foot uh, virginal by Boffo, made pretty much in the same uh, style, uh, just uh, overall larger, uh, you know, so a very profound sort of instrument, but the two of them work really interestingly together. So uh, perhaps a future concert would involve the three foot and the five foot. Uh, that would be an interesting concept. Uh, if we rotate just a little bit here, we'll see one of the uh, sigil instruments. This is the harpsichord from, uh, from roughly 1650, uh, an Italian harpsichord. We have uh, two Italian harpsichords in the collection. And uh, this one, uh, you know, I would say is perhaps uh, you know, the, the lesser of the two because the other one is absolutely exquisite. Uh, but this one has a lot to, to say for it, and uh, as an instrument representing its, its time, it helps take us through the seven centuries of keyboards. 
Uh, when we can come back, uh, we're going we're gonna to go through some of these Italian instruments in a little more detail, and I'll begin to talk about some of the intricacies, but because this is our first day, and this is kind of our, our, an introductory uh, you know, tour through the museum, I'm going to let us fly through for a second, and then we'll come back to some of these as we have time later on. So here we are now into the 18th century. Uh, the first instrument that I wanted to show is this one, uh, a small uh, English spinet. Well, I say small, but in fact this would be as, as full size as they came in the year 1712. So this is uh, Stephen Keane and Charles Brackley. This would be the last spinet, probably the last spinet that Stephen Keane ever built before he died in December of 1712. Albert yes. Rice has a question about who were the makers of the Arnaud clavichords. Uh, the, the, the maker of the Arnaud clavichord was Tom Strange. Uh, but many, many people have, have built uh, you know, copies from those drawings. And uh, they're all, most of them are, are just you know, wonderful to hear. All right, so uh, on this particular spinet, this was one that our good friend David Hackett uh, helped me with uh, when this one came up for sale. Uh, it required a little bit of uh, restoration, and part of the reason was that Originally, I think the soundboard was something of an experiment. It was only about one millimeter thick throughout, and that's more of a piece of veneer than a piece of soundboard. Uh, so we've done just a little bit of re-engineering underneath uh, to, to uh, increase the thickness up to about two, two and a half millimeters, and what has happened because of that is just startling. First of all, the compass evened out beautifully. The tuning stability came back and uh, the instrument actually turned into a more profound sort of instrument. What we did, however, was completely reversible. So if in a hundred years somebody says, oh, those, those uh, people, they didn't know what they were talking about, you know, this should be X, Y, Z, anything that we do can be undone, leaving the, the original history back where it was. So, but I have a feeling that no one will ever need to go back into this little uh, spinet again. And I think, this was more like what everybody was thinking about when they designed these things. So it's just a wonderful little instrument, and I've got to say that uh, of all the spinets that I've played, this is probably uh, my absolute favorite. Uh, not as, as huge a sound as the 1748 uh, Jacob Kirkman that we have, uh, but it draws you in, and it makes you want to hear more, and it makes you want to play more. And if you're a real musician, it makes you want to play better. Uh, so for my musician friends out there, uh, imagine uh, when we can all get back together again and we can have concerts, imagine the wonders that we could do with such a nice little spinet. We're going to rotate just a touch here. Aha, uh -huh. and now we have this wonderful double manual uh, Kirkman harps harpsichord. For those of you who have been watching me on Facebook, you know that I have actually been working on a harpsichord that looks startlingly, startlingly like this. Um, it is a, uh, this one is from 1758. I've been working on the one from 1761. Uh, they are almost identical, except that they're mirror images of each other. This one has the dark background with the light uh, marquetry on top. And the one from 1761, just the reverse. So the background is light, the figures are dark. Uh, I will say that with the light background and the dark figures, it tends to pop out even more than on this one. Um, you know, what a, uh, a, a treasure that we have, you know, two such harpsichords, uh, both in very good playing condition. Uh, I haven't tuned this one in a little while, and so rather than play for you today, I'm actually going to devote one of our little chapters on, on Kirkman, and we'll talk about Kirkman in a little more depth. 
And at that time, because the museum is closed and because the, the big curriculum is going to be coming to the museum directly and it's now finished, I'll go ahead and bring it here and then we'll, you guys will be uh, among the first to sneak peek and see the two harpsichords together. Can you explain the term spinet? Oh, okay, the term spinet. Uh, spinet, is, is the, as it was uh, you know, described in the earliest days, uh, it refers to a keyboard uh, where the, the keys are like this and then the strings come in uh, at an oblique angle to the, to, to the keys. So in a virginal, the strings would be perpendicular to the keys, and in a harpsichord, they're of course parallel with the keys. So you have the strings like this, the strings like this for a virginal, and then the strings at an angle for the spinet. Where did the term spinet come from? Uh, that, there is some uh, arguments that, that uh, occur over that. Uh, it seems to have come from a, a very early uh, instrument that uh, came out of Italy. Uh, but I would love to hear more from, from the, the, the crowd on where they think the origin of the term spinet came from. In America, it became something that we applied to small upright pianos uh, in the 1930s. And so uh, everybody today thinks of spinet as being a little spinet piano because so many were sold as spinet pianos. They were simply the very, very short, uh, inexpensive pianos that were being sold in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and etc. cetera. Uh, most of us grew up with one in the house. Can you take one more question? Yes. Uh, from John DeBose, are strings manufactured in the same way today as they were originally? If it's different, would that change the way it sounds? So the answer to the question of the strings is, is absolutely it changes the sound uh, dramatically as the metallurgy changes. Uh, are they being made exactly as they were? Well, I will tell you that I think Stephen Burkett uh, in Canada uh, has come as close as anyone ever has to the true historical metallurgy, both uh, iron and now brass. Uh, I've just finished stringing up the uh, 1761 Kirkman in uh, Burkett wire, and I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, back in the, the uh, early 1990s, late 1980s, uh, Malcolm Rose began uh, doing work with bringing back a more historical string wire. Uh, and uh, I've used rose wire uh, for 30 years now. So uh, rose wire, I think, is, is very good. Uh, Burkett, perhaps one touch uh, even better, uh, particularly on the harpsichords. I could, I could really tell a difference. Um, there were some experiments with things like stainless steel, the pure sound wire. Um, I thought that, uh, you know, Maybe for later pianos, uh, that middle age, uh, 1850, 1860, that that material worked okay. But I really think that, that we've learned an awful lot and that you know, we're making better wire than we ever did. These are very small pianos. These are what we think of as portable or traveling pianos. Uh, this is the little portable uh, 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 piano by uh, Louis Verrill. Uh, that was in the Colt collection for so many decades. And when the collection was sold, this was the one that I wanted to pick up. So I, I bought the little uh, barrel portable piano. Uh, once tuned uh, and, and made to play again, it has a lovely ethereal little sound. And you can easily imagine somebody wanting to take this out into the country and, and play and maybe play and sing at the same time. It fits comfortably under one arm, and it would be no problem for a, a gentleman or even a more robust young lady to pick this up and take it. The other one here um, by John and Archibald Watson, not so much a true portable piano, but a traveling piano. So the stand folds up. The piano itself only weighs about 35 pounds, uh, and two people can carry this very, very easily anywhere. In fact, two ladies would be able to carry this very, very easily without, uh, without any concern. And so these are here to just mention that there was a, an, an element of wanting to be outdoors and wanting to be among the, the you know, nature itself uh, in the 18th century that uh, we don't much think about now, but it was very, very popular. And to have these sort of instruments to be able to bring out into the countryside was something that was quite desirable. Uh, We'll, we'll talk about things like the uh, Orphica and uh, lying harp pianos in some of our subsequent uh, discussions. 
Uh, pointing out these two uh, pianos here, these are our two Broadwood grand pianos, 1791 and 1792. Uh, lovely instruments, both in excellent playing condition. And uh, in, in a uh, subsequent uh, discussion, we might uh, want to go into the English grand piano a little more closely, and I'll be able to take some, some of these you know, kind of to bits and you know, show you a little bit about how they work. I think it would be very fascinating to be able to see how it works and then to be able to hear how it plays. And uh, just to mention, uh, the last September, Lisa Lee and, and David Kaiser uh, you know, produced a, a beautiful uh, a, a musical program from the museum, uh, and you can still hear that on, on the Keys. So if you go to the On the Keys website for NPR uh, radio, then uh, you, know, you can actually hear that again. So now we're into the 19th century, and in the 19th century, I have, uh, I have the Johann Schramm's uh, grand piano from 1825, uh, a, a lovely concert grand sort of piano. Uh, this one also has the Janissary, and so in addition to being a lovely piano, uh, it has these wonderful sound effects where you can, uh, you can play the bassoon, you hear the buzzing sound, and then if you want to, you can ring the bell and beat the drum. Not something that you find on your normal home piano. Uh, but it was very, very popular at the time, and uh, you would find Janissary particularly on the Viennese instruments uh, from about 1805 until 1826. Uh, when we can talk about it a little bit more and show some of the other wonderful Viennese pianos that are coming with the Sigel collection, I'll tell a little bit more about some of those stories. In the back, we have a square piano uh, made by Robert uh, Nunn's Clark and Company uh, in 1834, came to America when it was, uh, or, or came to South Carolina, I should say, uh, when it was new and has been in the state the whole time. Uh, John Greer and uh, 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 Daniel Knox did a beautiful concert on that uh, earlier in March before we had to sort of uh, sequester and go into shelter. Uh, we hope to hear this again because they're going to bring this forward uh, when we can all get back together again and, and, and do some more work. But it was extremely well received, uh, beautiful piano, uh, continuing to rotate. This instrument here uh, is the 1845 Broadwood Grand Piano. Uh, this is a, a piano that Chopin himself actually played uh, when he came to London. Uh, for his uh, 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 England tour. Uh, he was doing little morning concerts in the spring when he came before the, the big tour started. And apparently uh, the Amory family were, was wealthy enough and well-connected enough that they engaged him for one of those morning concerts. Uh, the only thing that is remembered by the family was that the father thought it was awfully expensive to pay 20 guinea for a musician just to play for a couple of hours in the morning. Uh, but it's a beautiful piano. It's also something of a Rosetta Stone because when the piano, uh, when the last daughter died in 1923, they closed the piano up and they put it in a downstairs room and there it sat untouched until 2012. The house sold and the piano had to sell and that's when I bought it. Uh, it was tremendously dusty and dirty when I got it. Uh, but as I was cleaning it, I noticed that none of the usual problems had happened. It had not, not seen any water, it hadn't seen any mice, it hadn't seen any bugs, and I guess most importantly at all, of all, it had never seen a piano technician. So n nothing had been disturbed. It has the original hammer coverings, unchewed on, it has the original strings. And uh, so it's, t it's sort of as good an example of what must such a thing have sounded like as I think I can bring you. Uh, the, the wool had hardened just a little bit as the uh, atmospheric effects had caused it to you know, swell and shrink and swell and shrink as the humidity changes. But just with a little bit of voicing, and that's all we did, uh, we, we brought it back and it just sounds lovely.
So where we are right now uh, is the 20th century. We've gone through the 19th century. We're into the 20th century. We actually have two pianos uh, that were at the World's Fair in 1939, and both of them sold to their families uh, at that World's Fair. Uh, the, the one over here is the Ansley Dynatone, and then the uh, RCA uh, Victor and um, Story and Clark uh, Storytone piano. The Storytone is actually restored and, and up and working, and I thought I would just play it for a moment uh, to give you an idea of this very, very interesting sort of... So we have the normal uh, damper control here on the, the far right, and then we have a volume control where you would normally push the soft pedal. So this one has strings. It has strings just like a regular piano, but it does not have a soundboard. It has little pickups in the back, and, and it's like the, the electric guitar pickups. So without a soundboard to dissipate the sound, when I strike a chord, the sustain is just incredibly long because there's nothing to dissipate the sound except the, the air that the wire is beating against. It also stays in tune beautifully because there's no soundboard moving back and forth with humidity. And so it, the, the, the concept was actually quite interesting. We even have the ability to, uh, to add in some re re reverb. spaciousness of the sound. Um, unfortunately, uh, World War II got started and all piano production ended and when the war was over everybody was tired and this idea of pushing the envelope with this extremely deco, you know, gorgeous case and all that, you know, became a little bit more plain and a little bit more straightforward. Story and Clark uh, brought the story tone back, but this time with a regular soundboard and no electronics. So, uh, you know, the, the, the brilliance of this was something that only lasted for very few years. Uh, but it's really interesting that, that such a thing would exist. We have uh, a little instrument uh, uh, by Harold Rhodes called the Pre-Piano uh, from 1946. Uh, Harold Rhodes, as you guys uh, that have any experience with uh, you know jazz and, and rock groups and such, know that the Fender Rhodes electric piano was something that people used all the time. Well, this is sort of where it was before he got in with Fender, and so uh, an interesting little instrument. sort of like a little tuning fork piano. It hits little uh, uh, hardened steel bars and those bars vibrate and then there's an amplifier inside to pick up the vibrations and put it to a speaker that's also self-contained. So the whole thing is a nice little self-contained box. Um, they only made it for a couple of years and then they had to, to fade off. So interesting, uh, you know, little piece of uh, ephemera and then uh, as we pan around, we're seeing the Wurlitzer electric piano. Uh, this is the same model that uh, uh, you know, was used in, in so many of those Motown recordings. Um, and you know, just, it, it, it's just kind of classic. Uh, the little harpsichord here is an electric harpsichord where much like the story uh, and, and Clark uh, piano over there with the electric pickup, this has no soundboard, but it has an electric pickup for each string. Um, if you remember, you know, the, some of the music by the, the, the Beatles, Because, and, uh, you know, Joni Mitchell, uh, you know, famously used this. Um, you know, this is an instrument that you've, you've heard over and over and over from the 60s and 70s. And in fact, this is the very harpsichord that was used with Joni Mitchell when she was doing uh, Clouds. 
and then the Vox Continental organ, uh, you know, classic kind of uh, jazz rock organ from the time. And the animals, if you go and look at the House of the Rising Sun, you can see this one. Uh, we go into the, the very early digital keyboards, um, and then as I tell people, uh, the, you know, the crime of the century, uh, I've got the, the uh, Yamaha DX7 and M1 here at the museum, uh, but, but these were mine when they were new. And so, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> you, you own your, 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 own, your own museum. Uh, neat instruments, uh, you know, used extensively. And uh, so, the, you know, when we got finished, uh, the last thing that I was uh, showing everybody was the Rolly Seaboard. Uh, for those of you that have ever uh, messed with one of these, it's really neat. So we've gone from, you know, the little portable instrument to another little portable keyboard controller, uh, works with a computer, and there's no, actually no moving parts. So you, it's just like a, a, a foam pad that you press into and make the music. But it's really quite interesting. We have zoomed through seven centuries of keyboards. And I will be interested in the questions that you have and what you want to see more of. Uh, we'll be back on Friday. Be happy. Tune in. Uh, stay safe. Stay home. And